about your time as uh, in the department at Yale, but you were then appointed at some point to be head of the Peabody Museum. Um, how did that come about, and um, what were the high and low points of that experience? I, I, uh, I think I told you this, uh, that I started out being asked by the president of the university if I would consider being director of the Peabody Museum, mm. and I said no, because our children were young at the time. No. And so he said, well, would I serve on, serve on the search committee? And so I spent two years describing to various candidates why this was the most wonderful job uh, <laughs> and completely internalized my own rhetoric. Mm. And so then in two years' time, having failed to persuade anybody to take this position, the president said to me in one of the few humorous things he said, well, your children must have grown up by now so you can <laughs> take the job. And of course, by that stage, I was hoist by my own baton mm. and took it and indeed uh, loved it, loved it. I, I, I think that a natural history museum at this juncture in history, if you, if you can say that the 19th century uh, uh, and to some degree the 18th century, but particularly the 19th century was the age of collection, then the 20th century was the age of wringing your hands about what you do with all this stuff hmm. uh, in these enormous museums and provosts sort of look jaundiced because uh, they take up enormous amounts of space. And just the, f the fact of trying to understand what you have was an, was an insuperably large task, I believe. And there was a real loss of steam uh, over the course of the 20th century, not, not, not amongst those who were the aficionados, but uh, in the sort of broader academic and intellectual community. But uh, of course, the, uh, the new technologies allow one to, to capture information and then to be able to share it. So it has given the idea of access uh, and sort of the, the way in which these, these quite remarkable records of the history of life on Earth that are contained in natural history museums can be uh, made accessible, sort of organized. Uh, it, it's, it's been transformational. And that uh, occurred in the space of the last decade or so of the 20th century, and I, I was at the Peabody Museum at that moment when the collections manager was saying to me, impossible, impossible, you cannot possibly capture in an electronic digital form uh, the sort of the nuance and the detail that more or less with their quill pens they mm. were writing into these great big ledgers. Um, there is no format, uh, mm. no, no template that would allow us to do this. And within the space of a year, they had undergone a complete transformation. We had 18 million accessioned objects in the Peabody Museum at Yale. And it was supposed to take decades to get all of this into an electronic catalogue. Um, by the time I left after three and a half years, you know, because they were completely fired up to do this, uh, it was happening at the speed of light. And of course, that makes the collections of the Peabody accessible around the world. Uh, with what is going on environmentally in the world today, to have a historical record of uh, going back uh, 150, 200 years of various parts of the world, carefully kept and stored away, gives you uh, a real sort of new read on environmental change mm -hmm. from a different perspective. So all of that is interesting, and it's not like a book can be read many times and new meanings can be derived from one's reading, but one fundamentally reads it in the same way with the use of one's eyes. But of course these objects in a natural history museum can be uh, read in, in profoundly different ways as technologies evolve, so uh, it's, you know, being able to extract DNA from uh, sub-fossil material and from fossilized material even, uh, for example, gives you a whole new, completely and, and profoundly different way of understanding the meaning and the messages and, that are in these objects. So, so it's a very exciting time where the oldest and sort of most traditional of, uh, uh, of, 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 uh, of traditions, you know, dating back to the cabinet of curiosities and prior to that, and then through the great tradition of collecting, intersects with the technology of the here and now in ways that uh, were, were just 
incredibly exciting intellectually. Uh, but then, on top of that, of course, university museums uh, are portals uh, to the larger public and have this uh, uh, an exhibition function as a um, as in to my way of thinking as as, as a, a deep responsibility in terms of their mission because they are a way in which people can find their way into the intellectual life of the university quite literally uh, by coming in and by being captivated by wonderful ex exhibitions well how does one wonderfully exhibit things well you know how much writing do you put up on the wall and of course since the natural history museum at uh, at yale included uh, human material culture there are then as you will know far better than i uh, incredibly interesting uh, debates uh, and discussion to be had about the display of human material culture who is displaying it on behalf of whom and to whom and how do you situate it? So all of that made it for me uh, a really, really rich experience. It was a wonderful three and a half years. And in fact, um, when the president then went on to ask, and we did all kinds of things, the president asked me to serve as provost uh, for the university. I really didn't want to do it because I was not done in any sense with what I wanted to accomplish in the museum. We were building new storage uh, facilities um, that would ensure the, the, the good stewardship of this, these extraordinary objects. And we were reconfiguring the exhibit spaces of the museum. It was great. This, it was just wonderful with this very, very diverse staff and curators who worked with me. So, uh, so there is a big piece of my heart that is still actually in the Peabody Museum. And it was just great fun. Uh, whichever day of the week it was, when at the end of the day I went and spent an hour with Nick Thomas mm. in the Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology here, and all my juices were <laughs> again. I would have happily sort of taken up residence there, I think. Uh, mm. I mean, it must be rather nice being in a university such as this, which has a number of very interesting museums all congregated quite close together. And uh, But one thing I... It's not directly relevant, but I was talking to a Chinese... Japanese visitor yesterday and telling her about the history and culture of Cambridge and she said does Cambridge have a visitor centre like Oxford where you can learn everything you're telling me I mean people take guided tours round is there a place where you can go where you can see the old maps and where you can um, watch films of famous people and all these sorts of things and I said well there was a plan many years ago um, the mathematician Edwards thought of taking the old Addenbrooks over for um, a museum of that kind, a science museum, a great science museum, but it never came to anything. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But that I've always thought it's a terrible, wasted, lost opportunity. We get millions of visitors coming through. If we could give them a portal to enter, not just see the surface of Cambridge, but go inside it a bit, which you can't do by in a busy working place by letting them into departments, or then uh, we would educate them and interest them and do something worthwhile. And uh, having the vice chancellor here <laughs> to to um, mention this too, uh, has this ever been discussed? Or um well, it was certainly something that was under discussion uh, when I arrived here. Hmm. Um, not as you have. Uh, presented it in my view, there were, but there was a sort of a plan on the table that would have put a visitor centre into King's Parade, mm -hmm. uh, a very modern uh, sort of visitor centre. Um, uh, I'm very sympathetic to the idea of a, of a visitor centre, but I think you have to think very hard about you know, who, would it be for all these uh, tourists to come, or would it be for prospective students, or is it how museum-like... I mean, you're suggesting something that is more... Uh, um, maybe not museum-like, but it's, it's something that doesn't correspond to what I think of as a visitor centre, which is a place with pamphlets and not much depth mm, to it. No. Uh, but I, I think that Cambridge is very hard to visit in yes, any exactly. kind of serious way. 
you I and mean, you see that you mm. see that that you see the tourists walking along King's Parade, taking photographs, and then, then and there's n of what and I mean the, of iconic buildings mm. about which there is no explanation except mm. what their tour guide is telling them. Um, I, mean, I, I I think it's a it's a very unresolved issue for Cambridge mm. as to how tourism works here and how mm. we would wish it to work here. There are too many tourists, I think, who are coming in charabongs and spending very little time here, and if one could do it, it would be preferable to have maybe somewhat fewer tourists spending mm. more time mm. here and somehow being able to penetrate exactly. uh, the meanings and the richness of Cambridge, which the blue badge guides do brilliantly. Mm. Um, but as you say, you can't invite uh, tourists into departments and mm. or even into colleges in large measure. Mm. It's too disruptive. Uh, so think, I, I thinking of the Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology, which is hopefully going to have a new entrance and a, hopefully, hopefully, and, yes. a, and a new downstairs and, and temporary exhibition. I mean, something there, which was the Museum of Cambridge University and City, which. Uh, encourage people to come in and mm -hmm. to listen to lectures by famous mm -hmm. Cambridge figures and to um, have... Well, you put it in the corn exchange? Yeah, that, that would be ideal, absolutely mm -hmm. a perfect mm -hmm. place. Mm -hmm. Somewhere like that. Um, you know, I think it would, it could have a wonderful effect mm -hmm. and, and also answer the people who say, well, what is the university doing? I completely, I mean, I completely mm -hmm. agree with you. I have to say uh, that uh, my 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 scepticism with the vision as it was presented when I arrived here was also coupled with a sense that uh, we had, there were so many uh, needs mm. here and this would not go to the top of the list. I mean, adding another museum, mm. unless you found uh, a donor who was interested in doing only that, mm. um, it would be hard to justify diverting... Uh, the resources mm. to that when when all of our museums have so little dedicated funding for yeah. them mm. and we're entering and I worry because we're entering into times when I can only believe that uh, uh, things are going to get tougher not mm. easier and mm. they exist on very little as it is so, so mm. there's, all, the, there's all of that that plays into it but of the fundamental proposition mm. I think Cambridge is an, in, an inimical place to be no one a knows who was here I mean even to my friends and colleagues, I tell them about the roll call of great poets and great philosophers and great writers and painters, artists, as well as scientists who've been here. And I point, you know, this this is where the translator of the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam lived on the other side of King's Parade there, and Nabokov had a room there, and that's where Hardy discovered this, and that's where... The, and they're amazed. I mean, I do what these tour guides do, basically, but... If this was institutionalised, so you didn't have to take your chance with a tour guide, and you were taken round mm. Cambridge, mm. and then you could say, well, I'd like to mm. know more about molecular biology. And now, for the first time, you could do this. You couldn't do this ten years ago, but with modern technology... You could do it. And you then could you could, it. having taken the virtual tour, you could then go out and sort yeah, exactly. of see the things that, you were being, that were being explained to exactly. you. Exactly. This, mm. So it would be a double tour. You, you first, mm. it's like a, in some of the big American museums, you have an orientation film before you go around the museum, mm -hmm. as you know in the museum of American life, and uh, it would be something like that. Spend your first hour or two hours learning about Cambridge's history and the people who've been here and so on, and then look round, and you will see the gargoyles which you didn't know were there. You know, it would be so much richer and more interesting, and people would come back and. Do it again. And Hobson's conduit, which exactly. gives rise to Hobson's choice. Um, yes. it's, uh, there's, a lot, there's lots in the city mm. as well as the exactly. university. But anyway. I, it's know. time will come. It's <laughs> time will come. Yeah, I'm sure. Well, let, let's go on. You, you did um, succumb to the uh, persuasion to um, move on from the Peabody to become Provost of Yale. Um, tell me something about that experience of being now head of a very big university. Well, it was, uh, it was a very hard job. The division of labor uh, at Yale, the president uh, uh, 
had primary responsibility, has primary responsibility for setting the sort of the, if you will, the general articulating the general strategic uh, directions and for many for, for the externalities, the alumni, uh, national government, state government, uh, uh, international relationships. Um, and the provost's task is the day-to-day -day oversight and running of the academic and administrative uh, activities of the university, building the operating budget, building the capital budget. Now that presents it as too stark a division of labour because actually we talked every day and lived inside each other's heads. And so I never would have done anything major without uh, consulting with him, A, because he, was, he is very wise and astute, and B, because he is the president, and it's not for the provost to be sort of setting off in, on new uh, tangents without having the support of the president. Um, it, it was said at Yale that the task of the president was to walk through rooms uh, with people making requests with the president saying yes, and the provost would follow behind saying, I'll study it. Um, <laughs> but I was never put in that position by our president. He never sort of put me out. Uh, never exposed me to be sort of, so there was, there was never daylight between us. We, we worked really as a team. Um, and of course, I thought I had the more interesting job and he thought he had the more interesting job, I think. But I loved uh, being a provost. It was uh, uh, now, one looks from this side of the Atlantic, at least until the last few months, and you look at the enormous accumulation of wealth at Yale, and wonder how it could have been a tough job to be provost. But when I became provost in 1994, we were running a $20 million deficit, and it was projected to grow to $150 million. And my first task was to sit down and figure out where we would save a lot of money uh, to bring the budget back into balance. So uh, there's a sort of certain sense of being there, done that. Um, and you succeeded? But it, was, but it was overseeing all of them. And you succeeded in doing that? Yes, but we succeeded in no, in no small measure because the, the Yale endowment grew so rapidly mm. that we kind of grew out of the problem rather than mm. uh, the exactly. revenues grew, rather than having to, to, to save a lot. But you never feel any richer because uh, academics, I believe, if they are any good, and Cambridge, Yale academics are very good, uh, Cambridge academics are, will imagine creative and wonderful ways of spending money before it's actually even quite materialized. It's always because the, 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 uh, the aspirations and ambitions of the institution will and should always outstrip the available means. So whatever there was at Yale was always committed well in advance mm. of, uh, of the money showing up across the transom, so to speak. So there was always uh, a tension. But to be working in a very um, uh, sort of you know, on the ground, roll up one's sleeves way with senior academics uh, uh, thinking about working on very interesting problems having to do with the academic programs and uh, institutional policies of Yale. You know, and that was what I did uh, for eight and a half years. and. Uh, had practice at thinking about an 800th anniversary because, of course, we went to Yale's 300th anniversary mm. in 2001. So I, 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 it was a rehearsal mm. for, for our 800th year. Mm. But they were very interesting years, and uh, it does not surprise me that in these uh, difficult times that are kind of breaking over the U.S. universities mm. at the moment, I mean, they our turn will come, but as their endowments have plunged, I think that there is general agreement that the letter that uh, Rick Levin, the president of Yale, just sent out to alumni last week is the most thoughtful and uh, well considered of these letters that US university presidents have been sending out in some numbers. Mm. It's, um, mm. it's a letter of reassurance and seriousness for the Yale community. I can hear, I know just how hard he worked on that letter uh, <laughs> because I've seen him do it before and done it with him. Mm. And, uh, and it, 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 it's good, it's good. But that doesn't make it easy times. They've got to find a big, they've got a big hole in the budget.
budget mm -hmm. as a result of uh, mm -hmm. this autumn's activities in Venice? Well, uh, one could have a held interview further on, on the air, but um, I'd like sort of to draw it into the last phase of, of your coming to Cambridge. Mm -hmm. um, did you have difficulties in deciding when you were approached, presumably, to, to become an effective vice-chancellor, the first woman to be an effective, um, not just a ceremonial vice-chancellor at Cambridge? Did you? Well, I would say I had no difficulty when I was first approached in saying that I had no interest in <laughs> the position. I, w I was very clear in my mind, so I had no difficulty. Mm. And when I was offered the job, I had no difficulty accepting it instant, instantly. <laughs> so <laughs> what happened so, between? So, so what happened in between is the interesting question. Mm. Um, and, uh, and the short answer to that question is after... Uh, refusing to have anything to do with it over a period of several months, I was then persuaded by uh, my husband and uh, daughters, um, and somewhat too, it should be said, by the uh, indomitable Tony Badger, who was chairing the search committee, um, that I should go over for one day, that I owed it to Cambridge, I owed it to myself. So I came over for one day and was far from persuaded. I remember being far from persuaded. But then I came back and forth over the course of an autumn and met uh, members of the search committee and people outside the search committee as well. So I was being sort of looked at, as it were, but I was doing my own due diligence, except that the due diligence for, sort of took the form of kind of falling in love with Cambridge all over again. So that by the time I was offered the position, I was absolutely clear that this was a completely irresistible combination of a great university with its flags flying, its ambitions uh, set high, and all kinds of challenges. And so you put those two things together, and I hoped uh, that my experience from the eight and a half years at Yale could be helpful uh, to Cambridge, not to bring you know, to sort of plop things down here in any simple-minded way, but simply the, there were things that I'd learned and thought about that seemed to me might be uh, helpful here. And uh, so, so, you know, I, I, I felt I had something to contribute, or hope that I did. I saw this wonderful combination of excellence and challenge. And third, and not least, I met people who impressed me deeply by uh, their wisdom and thoughtfulness and their ambition for there to be change at Cambridge. And it was not just a few people, it was, it was enough people who, who uh, because I don't think that you can uh, accomplish anything uh, by yourself in a university. And that it's all done by working with people and if you're going to work with people you better be sure that there are people enough people who are like-minded with whom to work. Um, and, and I satisfied myself that that was indeed the case. So then it became very, then it wasn't difficult at all to say, oh, absolutely, <laughs> how would I, how could I possibly not? So that was, uh, that was my frame of mind in uh, December 2002, when my, I was unveiled, if I can <laughs> use that uh, term. Can you, I mean, is it appropriate to mention any of the people with whom you've worked and who, from perhaps early on, were the sort of people who were helping you to uh, affect changes and, and work in Cambridge? Are there people here who...? Well, I mean, it's the, I, I, it's, I think it's uh, invidious to single out names. I mean, mm. obviously, there are senior members of the, uh, or maybe not obviously, but senior mm. members of the administrative staff of the university, but uh, but, but but not just senior, and, and, and then the academic leaders of the mm. university, the chairs of schools, heads of departments. But it isn't only that, of course, because that's not actually the way uh, universities always work, or perhaps even often work, and there have been and still are uh, wonderful activities here of importance where I find myself working with people who are just sort of great, effective, 
passionate leaders without holding these more formal offices of the university. And if it's something that everybody is behind, as it were, and in sort of enthusiastic about, then, uh, then I put my shoulder to the wheel uh, it, it, you know, as, as it's appropriate and uh, helpful for me to do so. So, uh, so there's some of that too, mm. and uh, and it's 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 uh, I learn enormously and enjoy it because there's a great sense of uh, you know, shared enterprise when you're trying to accomplish something through frustrations and thick and thin. I mean, nothing is necessarily very easy, um, which is not in this instance a reflection on sort of the processes of Cambridge somehow being. Uh, difficult, or the processes of Cambridge take time, but I think if your case is well argued, they're not that difficult actually. Um, but it's more sort of securing gifts and getting structures set up and thinking things through in an intelligent way. Um, I think Cambridge is right to take more time so that what we do, whether it's the development of a new policy or the installation of a new piece of the institution's academic landscape. Those, those processes tend to be slow uh, because I think they then become, they're slow because people want to consider them and they often undergo, in my experience, modification along the way for the better. It isn't that they're chipped away at and you end up with a poor compromise. My experience is that actually Cambridge is very good at coming to an outcome uh, where, where there is a change from what was originally proposed, but the quality of the outcome is actually better than what was originally proposed. And because people have all had a go at it, it is then embedded in a way and becomes part of the fabric of the place. Um, and I... I, I uh, there, you know, it's not that it, you know, there are frustrations to be sure in that, but uh, I, I have come to feel that the way that we do things uh, is far more defensible than I think I probably felt the first year or so that I was here, where maybe I've just got worn down. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't think so. I think you come to understand things in different ways. I mean, not. Today, as you know, um, Cambridge has been placed not absolutely universally, but almost universally as the top of the, in the recent research assessment exercise uh, as a research university in the United Kingdom, and it's generally up in the top few in the world in all the Jiao Tong and other indexes. Um, it's a very difficult question, as it appears at the end of a long, long week, but um, why do you think it is? such a successful place, not, not merely in research, but also in teaching and um, teaching in the widest sense of helping young people to be become adults. I mean, what is it about Cambridge? I just have to go back to the beginning of uh, your question mm. and, uh, and, and say that uh, the headlines that are proclaiming Cambridge, of, of, of course it is pleasing, and I would be less than honest if I did not say that I'm delighted that Cambridge should be being uh, recognised as, uh, as, as, as a university of great and broad strength, uh, paramount, paramount in, in this country, and you know, a, a global player, as they say. But, but the idea that it's a simple affair of ranking, I mean, they, if you look at the, the data that is underlying this, I mean, in some broad sense, one, we can say, with reason, I think, that in general, our peers have looked at what we are all doing as a sort of collective uh, community of scholars and, and think that it's pretty fine. But mm. it's not all fine, mm. and there's lots that's extremely fine at other institutions, and in fact, there are lots that, at other institutions that is finer than, than yeah. what we are doing. So, <laughs> so, uh, so sort of the, the uh, sort of a triumphalist notion mm. of what this all means is not one that I would uh, uh, that I have in my mind. Mm. But I'm pleased because mm. it, you know, yes, there is great strength here, and I think mm. we all knew that. But it's good to to, to to have that affirmed. 
it's also, I think, uh, good to have it pointed out to us where mm. we might have thought that we had extraordinary quality and perhaps it's not as good as we thought. So mm. there, is, uh, it, it, there, is, there is some complexity in this. To what, do, uh, to what does one owe all of this uh, Because this I'm thinking quality? that as a historian looking back over the last you know, four or five hundred years, and there's no university on this planet that has contributed as much in, in a broad way, in, not just in academic subjects, but in poetry and many other things, um, as far as I know. And many visitors, great visitors to England, um, said this. And um, there is something about this, as you've often said yourself, this damp, remote, fen mm -hmm. town that seems to generate a lot of creativity and, and um, expertise. Um, well, you have to take out most of the 18th century, I would argue, from that statement. Really, because mm -hmm. one of the things that's very interesting about Cambridge's history is, yes, indeed, Cambridge has transformed the way the world works, transformed the way the world thinks, contributed, uh, uh, sort of created wealth to this world to a degree that is staggering. But it hasn't been all through its history. There have been some bad patches. Mm -hmm. One of the things that interests me is how it is that Cambridge has emerged from those bad patches to become truly great all over again. And I don't know enough about when I'm no longer by chance or I have the time, mm -hmm. I'm actually very interested to understand how this institution pulled itself or was pulled out of periods of doldrums to once more sort of flower with whatever it is that enables it m more often than not to flower. Um, now, one has to, uh, uh, you know, there were far few universities for much of our history, so there wasn't as much competition. Uh, I believe that the relative autonomy of uh, universities in this country for much of their history has been enormously important. And I think today that people confuse autonomy with uh, the receipt of public funding. They are not one and the same thing. It is possible to receive public funding and to have a high level of autonomy. Possible not to receive <laughs> public funding. Uh, and, and perhaps to not have as high a level of autonomy as one would wish. Uh, I do think that those go separately. I do think that as we become more and more relevant to society, and I think we are being viewed perceived as being more and more of more and more consequence, more and more relevant to society. The temptation for society to try to get its hands into this activity, which is increasingly it recognizes is of importance to it, you know, that, that temptation is going to grow. I have not encountered anywhere a will to undo the autonomy of universities. I don't think this is ideologically driven, uh, the sort of the will to to uh, to engage, and I take government in this instance to be, as it were, a proxy for society at large. Um, but uh, because I think that the power of that autonomy is uh, is 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 recognised. But so so I think autonomy is one piece of it. I think being a beautiful is a piece of it. It's a beautiful place to be. It, the colleges uh, provide a scale. Uh, that is uh, so referring to Marilyn Strathern, or at least she it's talks about. It's the genius of scale. Yes. That wonderful phrase that mm. I heard her give, which I think I believe that she hadn't ever said it before. But mm. as soon as I heard her say it, I knew mm. that in a single phrase she had captured mm. uh, exactly what needed to be captured about this uh, this brilliant ability to be uh, big and small at the same time. And Cambridge, that that has been. Uh, part of Cambridge's uh, sort of configuration from, you know, obviously sort of from from the earliest days. Uh, so, so, so you've got all of that, and then you've got to ensure that somehow or other you manage to attract extraordinary people into this free, uh, nurturing environment. Extraordinary minds. Uh, now, how, how that happened, you know, that, that, you know, 
I don't think Cambridge went out and recruited people uh, mm. in the way that we now go out and very systematically try and identify uh, who the brilliant minds of our day are. I don't know through those centuries how that process worked and I have the sense that it was a much more self-selected well, it's a Darwinian process, a random variation, selective retention, exactly as Darwin describes mm -hmm. it, because mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you get you know, Aaron Klug or Sidney Brenner or something arriving randomly, but they're kept, they're selectively retained, because yes. there's a recognition of, or Fred Sanger or something, a recognition of mm -hmm. ability, mm -hmm. and they stick stick with the place, mm -hmm. they like it, and the place likes them. But, uh, but as important for Cambridge, or perhaps even more important, no, as important, are not only those whom Cambridge attracts or retains, but it's those we send for. Mm. And of course Charles Darwin is the, uh, is mm. the example. And the, I, if you had to weigh uh, whether it is Cambridge academics, ideas and innovations and discoveries that have had the more transformational effect on the world, or the students that Cambridge has educated and sent forth into the world, that would be a difficult... Mm. Uh, and who then, through their own work, creativity, leadership, have uh, contributed to the world? I don't know how, you would, how the scales mm. would come down. doesn't matter. Both are important, I would submit. But certainly, I mean, for instance, in something like drama and um, the media and films and so on, what is done in Cambridge is nothing compared to what is done by people who were trained in Cambridge and went up through the yes, system yes, and then went is, off. Yes, exactly. I mean, it's a very, very good case in point. And it's done in Cambridge in this extraordinary way that is not driven by uh, the university, not even really supported by the university. <laughs> It's, this, uh, the, it's, the it's the spontaneity mm. of, uh, of, of the creation mm. of, of institutions about which people care passionately mm. and uh, work very hard at. It's mm. amazing, absolutely amazing. And it's obviously related to the fact that it's a total environment, as anthropologists call it. In other words, it's not a nine-to-five office environment when you come for the short and intense terms. Mm -hmm. Your whole life is taken over by it. So it's a, a moral sphere, a mental sphere, a ritual sphere, as well as an educational, intellectual sphere. And so you expand in all these ways, or you should do as a mm -hmm. student coming mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. And so it, even those who most deny that it ever had any effect on them directly usually have a footnote saying, well, actually, it changed my life. Nabokov is an example. He said, you know, he couldn't see any direct effect of Cambridge, but actually he knows it suffused all his writing thereafter, and there are many people who are the mm -hmm. same, mm -hmm. Coleridge or whatever. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I shouldn't be telling <laughs> you these things, I should be. Um, just, um, but I, but I, if I get just to uh, one last reflection, because uh, I have been asked this question, mm. you know, what is the secret of Cambridge's success? Mm. Uh, it does give you know. It, it, it is hard not to keep sort of uh, kind of you know. I I, I I don't stop kind of fussing about mm. that and mm. trying to trying to understand how a single when most institutions don't survive. Yeah. And it is said that there are only eighty five institutions in the world that have been around at least since fifteen twenty, and of those eighty five, seventy are universities. Well, and of course, we do a good bit better than 50 and 20. Mm. But when you pause and think about that, if it is even remotely accurate, um, it's an extraordinary statement about universities as very, very different kinds of organisations from most organisations. Uh, and, and mere survival would be remarkable. But the fact that we have not only survived, but here we are, uh, on the uh, you know the dawn of the twenty first century, uh, truly with our flags flying, you know, a splendid mm. university. This is th this needs explanation, and I, I mm. you know I, I I sort of offer my you, you sort of in thoughts about this, but I don't think it has been adequately uh, uh, explained. I've not seen or read, uh, or read an, uh, a a good mm. insight into this. Mm. Hmm.
just to just to end, uh, bring it back to yourself. Um, you mentioned that when you cease being vice chancellor, you'll look into the history of it more. When, wh how long is your term? When when? My term ends uh, on uh, September the thirtieth, uh, two thousand and ten. And what are your plans then? I your have no plans. <laughs> I plan to get my life back. Uh, <laughs> I plan to um, do a lot of things that I haven't done for. Mm. 15 years. Mm. Um, Including visits to Madagascar? Oh, yeah, but I, yes, I mean, I have obviously, as you know, been going mm. to Madagascar during all of these yeah. years, but for uh, just sort of painfully short uh, periods of time. And I, there's all of this data that I've been collecting all mm. of these years with my colleagues, and there is sort of, you know, may, maybe there is. Uh, a book, not a book about my own research, the data that I've been collecting there and now being uh, the primary investigator for that research is one of my former, actually two of my former graduate students, so I'm, if you will, a junior author or an aging author <laughs> on, uh, 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 with respect to that work. But we have been collecting data about the people, the demography, uh, prices of rice and uh, uh, um, infant mortality mm. uh, and and also sort of the passage of birds and butterflies and uh, all of the wildlife threats to the forest and what's been going on there so it's it's a 25 year history of a community of people and their environment and uh, I don't know whether there is something serious and worthwhile to be extracted from the data and to be turned into something that would be, uh, uh, you know, anthropological mm. in a broad sense, I I would be reluctant to write something that was just sort of half baked. I, mm. you know, that that's my fear that it's not serious enough. Mm. Um, but I'm greatly attracted to doing that, if truth be told, because it has been this big, long thread in my life, and I haven't brought it all together in mm. any way. So maybe that's one thing I will do, but if I do that, I'm not going to do it full-time. I just, I don't want to mm. do one thing mm. full-time. I, uh, mm. I want to be able to smell the roses and, um, and, in me, and inquire into other matters, like, the sort of, like this sort of episodic uh, sort of undoing this idea that Cambridge has been consistently great for 800 years. So I'll just like to go back and read as much as I could and try and sort of solve, probably just for my own satisfaction, mm. sort of come to try and understand a bit more about what I think about all of this because uh, I haven't I have time to think in a serious way about this institution's history or I've chosen not to make the time. I've spent mm. my time living in the present mm. and trying to help ensure that the future mm. um, is, is remains uh, uh, Right. Mm. Um, you mentioned smelling the roses. Um, does that suggest you're a, a gardener, or? Oh, I'm a gardener. Yes, yes. Except I haven't been a gardener now, mm. because uh, uh, in the vice chancellor has uh, no time for it, and gardeners to do the gardening. <laughs> and I have actually come to understand that just smelling the roses is not altogether b bad. You know, it's lovely <laughs> to walk around with one's beautiful garden to which one has done absolutely nothing oneself and really <laughs> enjoy it and uh, mm. there is a role for that. But I, I really enjoy to be uh, with my sleeves rolled up and a trowel in my hand on my, you know, on my hands and knees out in the garden digging something up or weeding or planting or whatever. So I'm really looking forward to, to being a gardener again. I love to cook and we love to cook for friends. And uh, we cook for friends one night of the year, uh, basically, no, Thanksgiving. Um, and that's it. And I miss that. I mean, there are just parts of life that don't have to do with high-minded things, but have to do with things that I enjoy. And enjoy doing with my husband. I mean, that's, uh, no, this, is, this, has, this, has, this is a consuming task. And uh, I have always enjoyed my life with my husband and there is not enough of that life to enjoy with him so there's a rebalancing in our lives that I'm really looking forward to actually. Well, that sounds a rather nice gentle note on which to end unless there's some large 
or a small topic which you would have liked me to ask you about and say anything like that? No, no. I mean, I think with respect to the future, the safest thing to say uh, is that I've never known what I was going to be when I grew up, <laughs> and I still don't, and I have no idea. Uh, mm. I mean, I don't intend to disappear and sort of potter mm. the rest of my life. That's not what mm. I have in mind, but I haven't decided, and I don't want to dis think about it now. I'm mm. painfully focused on Cambridge and the, the interest and excitement and rightness of this great 800th anniversary celebration uh, at a time of such tumult and disarray in the world. I mean, it just, I'm increasingly, I, I worried about our 800th anniversary celebrations because they can be such a dreadful, uh, self-congratulatory wallow. And uh, I never thought that Cambridge would do that because self-congratulatory warrows is not something Cambridge is very good at, would be my observation. But then you sort of wonder, well, what's the point in mm. something? What are we doing this for and who's mm. it for? But I actually believe that it will be a very sort of seriously affirmative uh, activity over the course of this coming year when, uh, when, the, when there is so much it seems to be sort of in motion and so much is uncertain in the world around us. And uh, and yet, you know, Cambridge persists. So you know, I'm 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 seriously excited at this point about that, and that's got my, all of my attention. Uh, and managing our way through whatever storms uh, will come our way, and there there surely will be. I mean, I, Cambridge is not immune uh, to what's going on in the world, and all of our revenue streams are being. Uh, or will be, I anticipate, hit mm. uh, one way or the other. So, so it's going to be tough as well, but uh, we'll survive. We'll survive. Something like that. Uh, lovely. Thank you very much indeed, Alison. That was lovely. Well, it's a long. <laughs> it's a, I feel, as I said to, uh, I think I'm sure I said it to you, but I've said it to my husband and our daughters because they have heard something of these mm -hmm. long conversations that I have now fulfilled all of my responsibilities to communicate about this and I don't, you know, I can, writing a memoir is not something that I have any interest in doing, mm. but this is wonderful. Mm. Thank yeah, you. Posterity can make of it what they will. I will go and worry about my letter to my successor and, and, and advise that person to mm. look at Alan McFarlane's uh, archives mm. if he wants to, he or she wants to know what was going on at Cambridge. That would be good. That would be good. It'll be a time capsule. Lovely. <laughs>
And I thought and thought about this and actually uh, came to understand that uh, now that our daughters are adults, 26 and 28 years old, there was actually... Their, a, names, are, their names are... Uh, Bessie and Charlotte. Bias, I think. Elizabeth. Yeah. But yeah. Elizabeth has been known as... We decided we give her the choice of not always calling herself Bessie, but she's actually... So we called her Elizabeth, but, hmm. but, but she has continued to call herself Bessie. Um, I realised that at some only partly conscious level, but, but it was actually partly conscious, I was censoring uh, talking about the girls out of respect for them because I didn't want to appropriate their lives, their adult lives now, uh, in an account of my own life and I felt that they were uh, entitled to privacy, if you will, and not their parents, their mothers telling. Uh, but uh, but but it's kind of that's I mean and I think that that's a I think that's right but I also think it's absurd <laughs> not to mention the fact that uh, that more you know they mean more to us than anything else anything else in our lives and have been a source of greater joy to us than anything else in our lives so I felt that sort of <laughs> in some sense of uh, completeness that simply to register that hmm. would be a good thing to register. So uh, I, I would add that. Thank you very much indeed.